Here we go. Now we are ready. All right, so this slide presentation will be the story of my quilt, Kaloli Moondance, the very beginnings of which began with a comment from my husband. You know, you haven't made a quilt from only leftover scraps of fabric for a while. And he was right. I had made a few quilts that way, but then beautiful yardage and fat quarters came into my life and I was caught up in their allure. But that seed of thought, working with scraps again, was planted in my mind. The second push for this quilt was an article in National Geographic a couple months later about vultures. Who knew they were such good parents and an underrated necessity for their environments, scavenging carcasses and yes, eating up scraps. My light bulb moment of two thoughts coming together. Next was to find photos to work from and photographer friend Joel Davidson volunteered some of his wildlife photography. Ginny Cat and I considered some options. Some of Joel's vulture photos are peeking out from under the pile at the top of this photo, but it was his marabou stork photos that caught my interest. I knew virtually nothing about marabou storks, but Joel told me that they are also scavengers, have wonderfully ugly heads, and flayed feathers at the end of their wings, three qualities I was looking for in my scrap-based subject. Using a running sequence of photos, I could pick and choose body parts to trace and create a single drawing of my ideal bird. When I teach, I have students enlarge their line drawings to the full size of their subject matter. In this case for myself, I chose to freehand draw the bird onto my foundation fabric, which is also patched together with scraps of plain fabric. Um, using my trace drawing and the original photos as reference, I got enough of the stork drawn to size to get started. By the way, marabou storks are the world's only carrion eating storks and have such a nasty disposition that even vultures and hyenas will wait their turn at a carcass. The more I learned about these birds, the more impressed I was with them. After subject matter and design comes fabric selection. For years, I've stuffed scraps into old suitcases, the vintage looking ones, meaning ones I remember from childhood. I love the look of them. Since there's no organizing system beyond the use of the suitcase, it's a matter of opening them up and rummaging through them for the color of the day. I decided to start with a head. Normally, a marabou stork's head, neck, and strange looking wattle are a sort of fleshy pink color. But looking at the value of that flesh color where it falls in the light dark range, it was somewhere in the medium range between the stark white and black of the bird's feathers. So I decided that my medium range of color is orange. And since I was working only with scraps I could find, my oranges drifted between yellow on one end of the scale and darker red orange on the other end. Literally scrap by scrap, the head and neck get filled in. Not allowing myself to peruse my piles of folded fabrics actually simplifies the fabric selection process. If I can't find what I think I need in the suitcases, then I have to think a little more creatively to work what I do find. Interesting bits and pieces get set aside on my board or nearby tables to pull from as I go. I call that my palette, an assortment of fabric shapes easily visible and ready to move around on my drawing. The lightest fabrics get arranged on the downy chest of the stork, what you see here in the lower left corner. In addition to light values, I look for patterned fabrics that have tufts of color or design. For the dark and straight wing feathers, I look for fabric scraps that have a linear quality to them, either in the cut itself or in the pattern in the fabric. But again, I'm working with what I find, so I have to work with serendipity and a why not sort of attitude. It's a very freeing way of working. Here you can see that some of that scrap chaos is coming together to create larger shapes of color and value. It's kind of in that messy, scary stage, but time and experience has taught me that as long as I put in the work, it eventually comes together. As I was moving along, I started to question the closed beak. Looking back at the sequence of photos, if the beak was open, it might be more expressive and dynamic. So I redrew the beak before I started collaging it. The photos on the left show that progress. But I was also questioning the tilt of the head. Working with a collage gives you some freedom for changing your mind. And cutting out parts to reposition is always an option. In the upper left, I could say I did like the head tilted up. Final adjustment, adjustments came lower left by severing the head and opening up space for an elongated neck. And on the right, 
The newly opened spaces of the foundation fabric have been patched up and in the process, covering up the confusing redraws. And this is where she developed a personality. She now looked happy and joyful. We nicknamed her Chloe the Kaloli bird. Kaloli being the Ugandan name for a marabou stork, a country where these birds are found in high numbers. In order to distinguish between different sections of the wings and to give interest to the darker values, I separated my dark scraps into piles with green accents for the upper edge of the bone structure and those with dark reds for the lower ridge of the bone. The long feathers close to the body were more brown and earthy darks. And as the wing unfolds and catches some light, I brought in blues and violets. And then as the wing tip further opens, separating into those distinctive fingers, I brought in more high contrast and colorful prints with overall darker values to them. Those splayed primary feathers of the wings were one of the features I wanted in my scrap eating bird. Vultures, buzzards, and now I know, marabou storks are all birds that have this distinctive flight position to their wings. Chloe was my summer into fall project for 2016, my 12th quilt that was part of my specimen special exhibit at the November 2016 International Quilt Festival in Houston, Texas. I do like working big. That's my 20 foot croc on the wall behind my current pinning board. There's more room to play with fabric when you work big, but birds you almost have to make big in order to have a decent amount of surface area for their little heads, long necks, and skinny legs. I learned that marabou storks get about five feet tall, so she's close to full size, with a wing spread of 12 feet, one of the largest spreads in the bird world. When working with a given selection of fabrics, you have to be inventive sometimes. And with, when faced with a lack of lighter values for her legs, I had to remind myself to look at the back of my scraps for variety. Overall, her legs have a light blue and lavender cast, as opposed to the light pinks and creams of her body. With each body part, I went back to the suitcases to see what I could find. In one suitcase, I found scraps from my pink rhino quilt, tickled pink. In another, polka dot prints from my polka dodo quilt, and orange bits from my pet portrait quilt, Golden Temple of the Good Girls. It entertained me to think that this scavenger bird quilt was going to contain pieces of a good decade's worth of quilts and numerous subjects, including my son's Peace, Love, Tie-Dye, Save the Whales portrait quilt. By the way, you can look up all those quilts on my website or Quilt Stories blog posts. Here are her feet in progress. Right foot on the top, left foot on the bottom. The initial fabric selections are placed and pinned on the left, trimmed and glued on the right. Working with scraps is interesting in that there's often very little cutting involved. Part of what I'm looking for are pieces of fabric that already have some of the work done for me like a pre-cut edge or a curve that fits my drawing. And all that I need to do is snip off a bit here or there, like trimming hair or toenails. So then my first draft of my ugly, marabou storks are listed as one of the 10 most ugly animals in the world, and cantankerous bird was done. But I found that Chloe made me smile. She looked like she was dancing to her own tune. And then in another light bulb moment, her dance, the late nights I was putting in under the full moon and a favorite song dancing in the moonlight by King Harvest came together and I not only had inspiration for her background but the name of the quilt Kaloli Moon Dance. Now if Chloe is dancing in the moonlight then the moon cresting her head is the first thing I needed to do in the background. I picked pale colors that said moon glow to me. I have a spiral design it symbolizes a new beginning and it's a fun and simple fabric collage project in itself, a spiral. But that's another story. In this story, the moon is one of three spirals I worked into the background. The messy, scary stage occurs again in the background, but Perseverance pulls it together eventually. In the rolling hills of Chloe's African landscape, the moon reflects on those farthest away. I had to keep in mind how the contrast of the background colors and values interacted with the colors and values of the bird. So the night sky had to get a little lighter against her dark wings. And as the ground moved closer to her, I could go to more intense and dark colors against her lighter parts. 
Although the moon is important, it has the lowest contrast to its surrounding colors, which allows it to visually recede in the composition. In the end, those gray colors curving around the moon gave the appearance of a sort of moon glow. There we go. The second and third spirals were to represent movement as Chloe interacted with her landscape. But in a very practical sense, they also helped give visual interest and balance to a lot of empty background behind this long-legged bird. Just a couple more areas to fill, some sky behind the wing and the ground beneath her feet. I felt lucky that light brown gold scraps were one of the few colors left to choose from, and I used the same golden color to fill in behind the red spiral, as if Chloe was kicking up some dust as she danced. Once the base fabrics are in place for the first draft, the, lex the left photo, I go back to fix it up. In the second draft, the photo on the right. Let me point out a few areas I changed. One, the feathers toward the end of the wing. They're more distinct in the second draft. Two, her eye didn't look quite right. It took me a little while to figure that one out, but I finally did. And three, extra shading, highlights, and general sparkle, especially on her head, neck, chest, tail, and legs, were added with layers of various netting and translucent fabrics, many embedded with glitter, and all of them scrap pieces, of course. A close-up of the first and second draft wing feathers. That lighter area toward the wing end was now blending value-wise with the background sky. The solution was to add contrast to the upper edges of those few feathers, plus some pink or light value highlights to the lower edges of a few other feathers. When in doubt, refer back to the original photos. They usually give the solution. Her eye seemed too far back on her head, but it was pretty accurate to the photo. However, upon closer scrutiny of the photo, I realized that her mouth opened quite a bit farther into her head than I had drawn it. Just look at the corner of her mouth in comparison to her neck. Her eye was in the right spot. It was her mouth that was wrong. A little cosmetic surgery and that was fixed. Then a little play with bits of sheer fabrics, some moonlight glitter and curls on her cheek, some eye accents, and feather tufts on her head and neck catching the moon glow and she is ready for the night. Adding translucent and sheer fabrics to a collage adds a whole other realm to your fabric stash, and it can be addictive. The photo on the right shows layers of lace, spirals, and a bit of printed organza, pinned in place to add extra highlights, shadows, and visual texture to Chloe's chest feathers. Eventually, these, la these lacy bits get lightly glued in place just like all the other pieces of fabric that make up her collage. Here's a close-up look at her hind end. First and second, could be third draft. You'll recognize some of the lace from her chest. They give a light fluffiness to those downy underside feathers as well. Darker sheer fabric, some with prints on them, shadow under her tail feathers and the top of her legs. More printed fabrics and silver mesh add more shadow and highlight to her bony elbows. And back up toward her head, light pink feathery lace, first used on my pink rhino of 10 years prior, adds finishing feather tufts to Chloe's shoulders and chest. Black polka dot sheer scraps, last used on Stevie the crocodile, add some shadow dimension to a very weird but distinctive fleshy orange mass on the back of a marabou stork. Eventually, it's time to call her done and quilt all her layers together. A spiral-like labyrinth design is my favorite way to free motion quilt, and I enjoy the randomness of variegated threads. For this quilt, they match the randomness of the scrap fabrics underneath as well. And that's the story of my beautifully ugly, invitingly intimidating, joyfully cranky, scrappy scavenger of a stork, my moonlight dancing Chloe of Kaloli Moondance.